My name is Jennifer Madrill. I'm the founder and executive director of Designers for Learning. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization with a mission to give people opportunities to gain volunteer experience while at the same time helping underserved educational needs. This video is one in a series of interviews I conducted to gather additional perspectives as part of our Design in the Open Challenge, a professional development opportunity we're offering to explore ways to cultivate your professional presence in your chosen field. In this interview, I'm speaking with Christy Tucker, a learning design consultant with CineEd Learning. Our conversation is inspired by themes forwarded in the book, Show Your Work, 10 Ways to Share Your Creativity and Get Discovered by Austin Kleon. In this conversation, we contemplate two themes of the book, including theme six, teach what you know, and theme seven, don't turn into human spam. We join the conversation as Christy provides us with her bio. Hi, I'm Christy Tucker. I own a business called Cinead Learning. I have been, my career has always been around, revolved around helping people learn. Um, I started out as a K-12 music and band teacher, and I taught public school for three years. I switched then to working with adults and doing corporate training. I went around to different businesses and taught people how to do Microsoft Office back in the days when people paid to have computer classrooms and have people go around to do that. Um, and then since 2004, I have been working in online learning. I've worked both in um, higher education, especially the for-profit higher ed world, and I have worked in corporate learning. I've been working as an independent consultant since 2011, so just over six years now. And I have been blogging for um, over 10 years. It'll be all, actually almost 11 years now. Um, so, and I know we're going to get into that a little bit more, but the blogging is is a big part of how I have that business. Okay, that is a perfect segue for, uh, <laughs> for what we'll be talking about. So uh, before I turn the recording on, um, Christy and I were, were speaking, we have quote, and I'm putting in air quotes because it is a term that we need to kind of define when we're talking about online friendships. I, I feel like she's my online friend that I've never, whom I've never met. <laughs> and so um, I, I don't know her work in terms of I've never actually worked on a project with her, but I have no trouble whatsoever in referring her to others um, for her professionalism. And so uh, in the spirit of our course, our uh, design in the open course, um, the premise of the course as everyone knows, is how to think of ways to develop and cultivate your professional presence. And the, the inspiration for the course, as well as our conversation today, um, goes back to the, the book we're using in the course. It's um, Austin Kleon's Show Your Workbook. And um, so what we were focusing on today are two of the principles in the book, uh, principles six and seven. Six is to teach what you know, and principle seven is don't turn into human spam. <laughs> so I think those are probably two areas that Christy probably has a lot to say. Um, so without me um, speaking too much, but I do just want to kind of um, give a little overview and a premise for our conversation today. We have a lot of opportunities within Designers for Learning for those in our network to communicate. And we have a Facebook group with, I think, five or 600 people and a LinkedIn group with 700 or 800. And they're quiet spaces. We have a lot of lurkers. They seem to like to come in and get some links and things like that, but I have a hard time cultivating the, um, the networking in the community that is kind of the, the holy grail and the, and the idea of having a network. So Christy, as she mentioned, is a blogger, but she's also a moderator on LinkedIn groups. So I'd certainly like to talk to her about some of that and this whole idea of kind of paying it forward, that, the, that it's network currency. What you put into the network, um, people begin to understand what you're, where you're coming from, your process, your thought process, and then they'll give you back. So with that as my kind of preamble to our conversation, I'd like to just kind of jump in and talk a little bit about, you mentioned your blogging history. Um, I also started about 2005, I regularly brought blogging, unfortunately I kind of let that die out in favor of webcasts these days, but tell us a little bit about why did you start and why do you continue doing it? Because it can be a lot of work, so tell us that story. So I started blogging in December 2006. I was working with um, an educator named Will Richardson at the time, um, as you, some of you may be familiar with, um, and we were working together on a course called Building Online Collaborative Environments, which was 
what was then called Web 2.0 tools mm -hmm. um, for teachers. And I decided that if I was writing this course telling teachers how fantastic it is to blog and how you should share all these things, that I should practice what I was <laughs> preaching. Was preaching yeah. And then I should go start this myself and then I should go do it. And and so that's really what it was. It was, I had no intention of, at the time that I started it, I wasn't trying to build a business. I wasn't even really trying to build a network. I was really just trying to, I had been reading blogs. Um, I'd been reading your blog, Jennifer, and I had been reading Will's blog and, and reading some others in the, in the education space. Um, but I decided that I wanted to write, um, and a lot of it over the years has been reflecting on whatever I'm learning at the time. Um, when I started out, I was doing lots of link for research, research for links for additional resources. I was doing a lot of curating resources for the courses that I was developing at the time. And so I got into the habit of using Digo, uh, D-I-I-G-O as my tool to, to save all of my links so that I have things in that those then got cloaked collected on my blog and I shared those on my blog and that was a lot of my early blogging and then whatever responding to other people's blog posts and saying okay this was an interesting idea that somebody had nowadays um, because that's been the reputation I've I've built um, and and nowadays because I'm specializing more in scenario based learning and using storytelling to provide relevant context for learning um, so those so that's most of what I write about in 2007, I wrote a post called, What Does an Instructional Designer Do? And that post still actually gets more traffic than anything else I have written since then. Mm -hmm. um, partly, Kathy Moore has linked to it, and there's a certain amount of that, but it ranks pretty high in the search engines. And so people who are trying to figure out what instructional designers do tend to find their way to that post. And from there, then they find other stuff. So that's kind of been the... So I've, I have written quite a few things about instructional design careers, too. So that means I have made lots of connections with people who are getting started in the field or trying to switch to the field from teaching, like I did, to, you know, how do you move from teaching to instructional design or how do you move from some other field into instructional design? So I find um, I've got lots of those connections, um, as well as now, because I'm writing on the storytelling, lots more other instructional designers who are who are reading it and finding it um, for that more advanced work. Yeah, and it is interesting how things evolve once you start getting what, what I term readership. Uh, at least it was for me. I started out, as you said, um, more just for my own use, collecting things. But when you do start realizing that when you search for something and your blog pops up, you're like, whoa, some people are actually reading this. And in other conversations we've got in these, this video series for this course, I'm putting this under the heading of reflexivity. And so this idea of the cause and effect of what we do when we share in the open. So by you putting yourself out there as a means of getting to know and understand the field, they be, the field begins to kind of morph and change based on your presence. And I think that's a really mm -hmm. cool, interesting phenomenon of blogging. We kind of joke, blogging is dead, long live blogging. And as you said, now we're pushing, you know, a couple decades now into the second decade, maybe of some of us. Um, yep. And it is, as I said, I, I kind of stopped at, at points in my life because I took on other ways to express myself. Um, but then how did you then make the transition from blogging, which is kind of just you talking to either yourself or the world, however you mm -hmm. can your audience, to then engaging in something like linked, uh, um, LinkedIn, where um, you're a moderator on one of the LinkedIn groups for instructional design. What, what kind of, how did you morph into that? So one of the things that I learned with the blogging is when you are blogging for 10 years, and, and I'm, I'm publishing a post at least every two weeks, and I usually post something with bookmarks and links um, once a month too, um, you need lots of topics to talk about. Yeah. And I used to actually have a giant button on my blog that said, ask a question. Um, and I still get a fair number of those questions, and those questions often actually prompt good posts. But I also discovered that it was um, helpful to go talk to people in LinkedIn groups or Facebook groups, or um, nowadays there's a Reddit instructional design community that's actually pretty good, and I've gotten some posts from there. Um, so going and looking at what questions people are asking and then writing the answers 
So if I write two paragraphs in the LinkedIn group to answer somebody's question, I've already written half a blog post. Right. And I can recycle that content. So part of it is that I, w I had gotten really active. Um, the group I moderate is called the Elin and Global Network, and that's a uh, it's an international group of people, and it's all focused on e-learning. Um, that group um, was very active with conversations when I took over. Uh, we're at between thirty thousand and thirty-one thousand members right now. Um, mostly people lurking and not active. Um, but before two years ago when LinkedIn made their changes to groups and was sending more emails out, we had a really active conversation. And that group is more tightly moderated than um, any of the other groups that I have, that I am a member of, um, where every single post must ask a question. Yeah. You have to ask a question in order and to start a conversation. You can't just post a link and say, here's the article, what do you think? That's not a substantive question. Mm -hmm. um, and okay. so... I think also ties into one of the principles within Cleon is don't turn into human span. But I think that's it brilliant is. because you get away from people saying, here's my webinar. Come, <laughs> come look at it. Right. Come Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I know I'm kind of jumping to that second principle of the don't be human span. But that's how we deal with it in that group is we say, sure, you can, you can share a link, but you have to ask an open-ended, substantive question that people can answer even if they haven't read your article. Mm -hmm. Because, and we, and we get some good discussions about that, and there's ways to do that, and I actually even coach people sometimes on, you know, how to do that, where they'll send me a, okay, here's my link, and here's how I want to introduce it. Is this good enough to meet those requirements? And, and I'll help them write a better question to prompt a discussion. Um, but that's part of it there is that we really focus on, on asking questions um, because it's part of how you get away from just the spam. Yeah. Um, and even LinkedIn's own internal research shows that if you're just doing stuff of like posting a link with no introduction and no other information, no say little highlight or summary from the article that you're posting, those things don't get very much engagement. Whereas if you post questions, if you put the effort in to post a thoughtful question to prompt something to it, or if you say you've got five points that you're making in a blog post and you say, okay, I think the most important one of these is this point is, you know, what, what do you think, what do you all think is the most important? If you could take something off this list, what would you take off? That generates a question, that generates conversation. And you're, you're contributing to the group and to the value of that group by asking questions. See, I'm learning already. I think I'm really understanding now maybe why a lot of my <laughs> groups are languishing because they, we, we do use it as a bulletin board a lot of times. Right. You know, an right. Update on the course, so we've got another course we're enrolling and it becomes a bulletin board right. rather than a discussion board, which is very different. Right. Um, and, and there's a purpose for bulletin boards. There's a purpose for sharing stuff. My company Facebook page is pretty well a bulletin board. It's I'm sharing my blog posts. I'm sharing sometimes some blog posts from other people. But it's mostly just kind of a one-way channel. I'm not actually trying to build a community on Facebook currently. So that's I'm just really republishing my blog posts for the people who would rather read it on Facebook than through an RSS reader. Right, right. It, it, there's a purpose for that too. But if you want the conversation. LinkedIn, a couple of years ago, it was great. You know, three, four years ago, I had lots of really valuable conversations on LinkedIn in groups. Um, because they, two years ago, they changed some of the interface and they quit. They used to send out emails to everybody for new posts. And when you got replies to the post, you'd get an email. LinkedIn lost a lawsuit related to sending too many emails. And so they cut down how many emails they were sending out from groups. And that has drastically dropped the um, conversation. We still have some in, in the Linden Global Network, I, and I'm still moderating it every day and deleting people's spam <laughs> and sending the messages, explaining the rules to them again. Right, um, right. But, but it, it, isn't, it isn't what it was. Um, I, I actually feel like on LinkedIn, there's more conversations now with people posting to their individual activity mm -hmm. feed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I, like, I've changed to LinkedIn where I'm accepting more, many more invites now, where when I started it really was the like people I know and have worked with, or 
at least that I know online, you know, people like you who I've, I've known online for years and years and, you know, that we've commented back and forth on each other's blogs and, mm -hmm. and in other formats. Um, now I mostly connect with anybody who sends me an invite, especially if it's personalized and I can see that there's some obvious connection to ability. instructional design, yeah. e-learning, something. Right. Um, because I'm using it for content more and we're having more conversations about stuff. Um, there was a great conversation that somebody posted a, a question about research related to storytelling for learning and, and how does that work? And it wasn't even somebody who's one of my direct connections, but my direct connection tagged me in the reply so I could do some stuff. And so I'd been in there and Patty Shank had been in there and Will Talheimer had been in that discussion. And um, it's, uh, uh, several other people had gotten tagged and, and gotten in there. There's 65 responses on that two sentence post asking for resources related to storytelling and research. Right. So there's some great conversations in LinkedIn happening outside of groups, not as many inside of groups anymore. And that's really perfect because one of the things this course is about is um, it, we're building it as a design challenge. And so our hope is that people try some of these things. And I, I know they're, if you've never been in the online world, it's certainly scary. And there are negatives, which we won't spend much time on today right. of, of this world. You know, things can get a little wonky at times. But um, if you really are at that point in your career that you feel like you need to expand your network, um, it is a place. I, I was, uh, before we turned on the recording, I was laughing with Christy that uh, one of our online uh, common, I'm sure you certainly followed Alec Koros's work as well, um, I mentioned that he considers LinkedIn to be like Pokemon. You know, you just catch them all. <laughs> you just want to make sure you, yep. if it has some relevance to your interests and your background, um, it, it, there's usually some value in the connection and spending the time to do it. Um, which then is, I think, a perfect segue into what I wanted to talk to you about um, in terms of this, these, the principles of show your work. Um, the, the value of teaching. And so um, it's certainly as you're talking, I'm sure I know you're not getting paid to do your, uh, your LinkedIn moderation. I'm assuming right. you're not getting paid right. for these things. Um, and so, you know, there, you have to, as human beings, we have to take our, um, all the opportunities that we face and decide what, what we're going to do. So Cleon is a, a, um, a quote in his blog, which by the way, his blog is quite excellent. He's now getting back into it, kind of like me. He goes through cycles where he does and he doesn't. And um, he talks about teaching, does, um, teaching people doesn't subtract value from what you do, it actually adds to it. When you teach someone how to do your work, you are in effect generating more interest in your work. People feel closer to your work because you're letting them into what you know. And I just think that is so much like you. Like I said, I, I really do. I refer people to Christy for her work that I've never seen <laughs> because I know her pro process. I don't necessarily know her work. So I feel confident enough that I'm like, okay, I get it. I get where she's coming from as a designer. I get what, what, what she's all about. And so I feel, um, feel comfortable doing that. So um, if you could speak a little bit to that idea that you're a very busy freelancer, you've got family obligations. And so these things all take time. And so you, how do you make a couple different questions that you how do you pick what you want to focus on and do you you know how, to what extent do you see value into this idea of teaching others as a way of you then getting more people aware of what you do in your work so for me the blog is is my ongoing marketing for my business okay. the majority of my clients actually do find me through my blog so while i make very little directly from my blog um, I've made about $250 the last two years um, doing Amazon affiliate links for the books that I recommend. I do some book reviews, and so I make $250. So if you figure I'm spending 45 minutes to an hour every single week, and I made $250 for the year, that's not a good hour. <laughs> right? Yes, right, exactly. However, um, it, it is that actually people... Google instructional design, find that post of what, what is an instructional designer? What do instructional designers do? And then they read a couple of my posts and then they contact me through my website. And almost always if I have a client who has no other connection to me, um, it's because they found me, they found my blog. Either it was linked uh, to, from somewhere where they were looking because um, when you create value for other people, and you get known, people will start linking to you, and that's that advertisement for you, um, that the people will do that. Um, 
or they they found it through Google and and just searching. So so I don't I don't do Facebook ads. I don't do um, other kind of direct marketing kinds of things. I don't even go to like local events and do networking a whole lot. Um, my work pretty much comes from my blog and the other places that I am online or from referrals. Mm -hmm. um, and the referrals are either people that I worked with at previous jobs. Um, I, I worked at Cisco for two years and so I know a lot of people through there and I've worked several other places. Um, and so I know people through, through those previous jobs. Um, or it's people that I know online. And I've gotten referrals from people like you who I only know online um, that we've never met. Um, so I think I decide that, so my thing is Thursdays, I spend 45 minutes every Thursday, that's a block of time that is reserved to work on a blog post. Um, I always have some amount of like answering questions and doing other stuff. Um, and I do that before I start working on work for clients or doing other things because I've discovered that I have to have it on my schedule. Um, I have a schedule of what posts I'm going to write next. So I'm not looking at a blank page with no idea what my topic is. Um, I have a, a Google doc where I just have a list of all sorts of um, blog post ideas of questions that came up or, um, there was just a discussion on, on the Reddit instruction design channel where somebody asked what a typical day for an instruction designer was. I'm like, okay, I can't write a typical day. I'm going to write a typical week. <laughs> but okay, so I wrote it out and then it's like, uh, this is half a blog post. I'm going to go dump that in my Google Doc and have it as a, as a draft that I will maybe get out there someday. Um, I think I'm understanding why you keep this up better than I do. I was more ad hoc. <laughs> it was like something and, was and, and that's part of it. <laughs> yeah. You're really going to do it and keep it up. I, I, have, I had been sporadic earlier on, um, and I did take time off after my daughter was born. Um, I took about four months off at that point. Um, but I decided that when I left my job at Cisco to become independent and that the blog was going to be a the primary way I was marketing my business that I was going to have to invest in. If you're an independent consultant, um, it's a book by Joel Gendelman called Consulting Basics um, that is consulting for trainers and instructional designers and course writers. It's specific to that. And he talks about that you have to kind of budget that you're going to spend one day a week working on your business. And that means your blog or your email or your whatever you're outreach doing somehow right? your, your outreach mm -hmm. your networking your writing proposals mm -hmm. um i find with social media that it's more of i'm spending a little bit of time every day mm -hmm. <laughs> in blocks rather than i'm going to do all of it on one day a week but you figure out how to do it um and if i don't get my writing done on a thursday um then that stays on my to-do list until I get it done. And I may do it on the weekend or on Monday mornings or something in order to make sure that I've got it, that I get it done so that I can stay on schedule. Um, and having a system for it and establishing a habit, I think is a really big part to doing it systematically. And it, in terms of, you asked about, you know, picking which tools you're gonna do. Um, the blogging has worked great for me because I really like writing. Mm -hmm. um, it is a good way for me to process the things that I'm learning, um, and I'm I'm happier doing that than than video at least right now. Um, but I know people who do podcasts. I know people who are doing YouTube channels has become a big thing, and so there's ways to do it there. There's plenty of people in the there's people in the Reddit community in um, the e-learning heroes community with Articulate. Um, you can do even sort of one of those things without necessarily just doing it on your own platform. Um, and by the way, we'll definitely link all these things. Yes, uh, so all <laughs> these things are, these are great. I'm gonna mention yeah. a bunch of these things. Yeah, that's um, great. Yeah, so I think that that's, um, if you're just getting started and you have none of this, go read in a bunch of different platforms and go pick one of them. Don't, don't think you have to do everything it's at the beginning. Yes, I'm doing 
a blog and moderating a LinkedIn group, and I'm a member of six other LinkedIn groups, and I'm in a Facebook group, and I'm in two Slack chat, two Slack chats, and I'm <laughs> on Twitter, and uh, I deliver webinars for the Allen Network of Independent Learning Professionals, and I sometimes join the TLD chat. No, you don't feel like you have to do it. I've had 10 years to build this up incrementally. Right. Don't look at me and think that's where you start. Right. Know that I took 10 years to build myself up to this. So pick one thing and do it and try it out. And, and you know, give it a real chance. And then revisit it. And if it's not working, drop it and go do something else. There's a bunch of different ways. If the blogging thing is totally not working for you, which it doesn't work for everybody, then make relabel them articles on your website, take off the dates, and go do something on YouTube or a podcast or something. <laughs> yeah. like and there's not a right way to do it. But there really is a lot to be said for that contributing in some way, in being seen as somebody who's helpful, and being seen as somebody who's answering questions, um, I literally in a LinkedIn group um, early in my freelance career, I got a $16,000 contract because I had answered somebody's question in a LinkedIn group. Wow. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't the, the person who I answered the question for. It was somebody else who saw that I was helpful and that I knew what I was talking about. And so he contacted me and I got a $16,000 gig out of it. Now, LinkedIn groups probably aren't the place I'd recommend for that right now but I know that people find jobs like that all the time on e-learning heroes right. and that people get stuff from reddit or they get things like that yeah good <laughs> oh I'm sorry I was gonna say yeah and it is the risk of like saying it, 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 what you're talking about is after you developed your career for 10 years and one of the quotes that I had within Cleon is uh, that I pulled from his blog is he's like, um, they, I'm trying to paraphrase as I'm reading it here on the screen. Um, if you want followers, be someone worth following. Don't be creepy. Don't waste people's time. And don't ever ask people to follow you. And in any rate, follow me back is the saddest question on the internet. And I, I've, I remember back in the day when people were just learning to, about the blogging world and, and trying mm -hmm. all the things you're talking about. And one of the catchphrases I always use is, it's hard to collaborate alone. But it can be a lonely place. Like, as you said, you, you, how many posts have you made and done and nothing has come of it? And it take, it's taken you a while. So, you know, certainly we're not saying, yeah, all you have to do is go on LinkedIn and make a, a few great comments and a $16,000 contract is going to yeah. come your way. I mean, this isn't, you know, even though we're advocating, if you haven't started, start somewhere. Right. Please also on the flip side, don't think, oh, that means I'm going to get a big contract next week. So, yeah. It's, right. This is, this is all long-term strategy. Yeah. Short-term strategies there is, is different. You can, there's some short-term things you can do, like asking people directly for referrals. Or once you get one client at the end of that project, you can ask them, hey, is there anybody else that you, you would recommend that I talk to about doing some similar work? And you, you take that one happy client and ask them for three other names and you go contact three other people. There's some short-term strategies to get you work next month. Blogging is not that. Blogging right. is going to get you any work next month. That's, that's not the thing. The, the time frame is, is much longer than that. It is, it is good. Clean doesn't talk about it in, in, the, in the blog and the things I've read of so much of being your learning tool, but it is definitely also your learning tool. You know, you think about how many things where you learn it and then you reflect on it. And, and I talk to people sometimes who are just getting started in the field who feel like, oh, you know, yeah, Christy's been doing this for so long. Of course she has things to share, but I'm just getting started. Um, I started my blog in 2006. I'd been working as an instructional designer for two and a half years at that point. So I was not super um, experienced when I started it. Um, the other thing that people can do when they're just breaking in is ask good questions because that actually contributes a lot to a discussion, to a community. So if you don't feel like you have great knowledge to share, um, Maybe you have good questions because that's, it's really important in a, in a community. You know, you go on the Designers for Learning Facebook group and go ask questions because that actually contributes a lot of value to, to a community as well. And, and people will see that you are being thoughtful and that you are learning. And that also earns you a good reputation.
Right, right. Yeah, and that's been a theme that we've been talking in the other videos about as well is this idea. It is hard. It's, it's scary when you're new to a field. You don't know the vocabulary. You don't know the players. You don't want to say something that, you know, proves that you're a novice. Um, so it is a little bit scary. But also at the same time, I think most people, especially in our field, if we're talking mainly in the education field, most of the people are teachers and are very um, open to people who are trying. And if you're mm -hmm. showing that you have the passion and that you're trying to learn and you're not there to spam, I, I rarely do you find someone who will write a snarky comment back like, you, you, you don't belong here. Why are you, you know, you, you don't, it's just yes. not part of the deal. You know, you don't it, this is a field where people really genuinely like to help each other. Um, and I've seen that across lots of different communities and different platforms that instructional design is one of these fields where we're in this to help people learn that's why we're here doing this work and so of course when people ask questions in an online community we want to be helpful we like can't stop ourselves right, right. <laughs> right, right. exactly and, yeah, right. and that's part of it don't don't fight that instinct and even if you're not sure that's fine that's, I guess, I you know that that's also one of those other principles that somebody else is going to talk about of like, don't think that it all has to be perfect. Right, right. Yeah, I remember back, um, you know, tell, telling war stories here, but uh, when I was first contemplating my dissertation topic, I, um, I was responding to a crit critique of research. And so I'm sure, as most people do, the, the person I was uh, writing about did a periodic vanity search, and you know, mm -hmm. my, my mind popped up, and he felt compelled to come on my blog and say, what you talking about? <laughs> yep. And so here I am, a little lowly uh, graduate student writing a dissertation and actually uh, responding to critique of this person's research. And so, yeah, I, at that moment, I did feel like a pretty small uh, person within the field. But, I mean, he took the time, and it definitely made my work better because, I, again, this whole idea of audience, I knew it wasn't just me and writing in a journal. I knew that, boy, I better get this right because the people who responded to his, the, the critique to his work as well as he would eventually be reading what I'm putting out there. And it just became very real then, you know, that it was, yeah. this was a real thing. This wasn't just hypothetical. Well, yeah. we're running up on our, on our half hour and I don't want to keep, yeah. as you said, busy, a uh, busy freelancer, but if you could, and we'll definitely put these in our, um, in the course and in the show notes when we talk about um, uh, some of the links you're sharing. But right now, like, who are your personal inspirations or where are you going now for your, like, where are your pisties? <laughs> where are you, where should we point our, uh, our browser to check out some, some cool things? So I, I love the people who are working to make research accessible to practitioners. Because uh -huh. um, I, I really, I, I want to use the, the research and use the evidence-based methods to make my work as good as possible. And, and I don't, have access to a big university library and to you know i can't do a full ebsco search i don't i don't have that access so i love the people who go through that research for me um so betty shank um she's uh currently writing for the science of learning blog on atd um she has her own website um and you can find her in several places online she's written two great books recently um that are specifically about making research accessible to practitioners write new organize for deeper learning and practice and feedback for deeper learning um those are the beginning of a series that uh there's should should have more out next year um will tallheimer um at worklearning.com is another one who writes great stuff on summarizing research he literally reads probably between 250 to 300 studies every year and then summarizes things and puts it out there and makes it accessible um, julie dirksen uh, author wow. of design for how people learn mm -hmm. um she has a relatively new facebook group um and we can get the the link in there for that you have to request um, membership but that's been um, she's working on building a community there and having some um some conversations there about research and how do we do better with learning um so i love julie's work and i i think that the you know she's working on trying to build that community and get people asking good questions about the things that work and don't um, in learning that's wonderful well thank you so much for your time and sharing and like not just sharing today but truly thank you for it's appreciated so i know as you said it's it can be hard work and all the planning and the preparation and the actually doing of the uh of the sharing, but just please let, let I want to let you know that we're, we're listening, <laughs> you're reading, so.
Thank you so much, Christy, yeah. for joining us today. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.